Zebedee. I want to start off with Zebedee. It almost sounds like it belongs in a Disney song. Zebedee do da Zebedee. <laughs> that is called a gratuitous laugh from my daughter. <laughs> That was good. I was th trying to think of what song it would be. And yeah. you, you Some of those names sound one. just like. Oh, um, no, we're on chapter 21 of Matthew. Right. Okay, so the disciples, Jesus has them go get a donkey from a neighboring village. <laughs> <laughs> and a colt. <laughs> a donkey. <laughs> Mom. And and baby, um, for him to ride because it was a fulfillment of what was spoken through the prophet before, um, and Zachariah. oh, how you know that? Well, <laughs> hopefully that's why you're talking to me. Um, and when he rides it people lay their cloaks down for him why like what is that it's humility it's an ancient practice in the old testament when kings would enter a city after they have had a victory over another providence or people they would ride into their own town and they would ride on horses and they and the people would throw their clothing down for him to ride over as a sign of we lay our everything before you. The palm leaves, the shouting, it's all to give honor to the victorious king. But to a Jew who was under the law of God in their heart, they rode donkeys. Why? Because those were not animals of warfare. Those were animals of humility. So their king was supposed to ride in on a donkey. Not all The Jews didn't ride horses because those were of war. So he rides in, and it was prophesied that he would ride in on the foal of an ass in Zechariah 9.9, on an animal that's never been ridden, okay? Mm -hmm. And so for him to get on the back of an animal that's never been ridden shows that he has the power to curb all animal appetites, because the animal, if it's never been ridden, you're not going to get on a donkey's back if it's never been ridden. He was going to get bucked all the way into Jerusalem, right? But he's the Lord. <laughs> so he sat on that baby, and that donkey was like, all right, just to let you. So it was a, it was prophesied. By the way, <laughs> you love the idea of Jesus getting bucked all the way. I'm just fixing <laughs> your face when you did that. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it was a donkey that even the large came. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, the King's Colt is all about that little book for children. Is this donkey could not be tamed by anybody ever until Jesus sat on its back. Mm -hmm. Story of that. But anyway, just to let you know as a little side thing, I have a Jewish friend and he was in the school of ministry with me and he studied the Torah. He believed it and everything. And he came to Zechariah 9, 9. And he has been to Jerusalem. He's been to Israel. His family's there. And he read that the Messiah would ride in on a mule. And he said, that could not be today. It had to have happened anciently because mules and donkeys are not ridden by anybody in Jerusalem anymore. It's all Mercedes and trucks. And he said, I came to, the light came on. He has come. Wow. That's wild. Isn't that? Yeah, that's really cool. Um, well, something that I didn't realize is that he would have the entrance of people laying their cloaks down. Like what when how is he received like that still? The connection to that is Jesus went right before he's gonna get crucified and uh he does a miracle. He raises Lazarus from the dead, okay? And many Jews were there mourning with Mary and Martha. They were mourning Lazarus' death. He laid in the tomb four days before Jesus came back. Mm. The, the whole story is that they sent word to Jesus, Lazarus is sick, and he stayed away for four days. 
and Lazarus died and was buried. And so all the Jews came together to mourn him, and Jesus came, and he raised him from the dead uh -huh. and increased his popularity at the end as the Messiah big time. Everybody came back and said, and so at the high holidays for Jerusalem, all these Jews were coming that had heard of this miracle. They want to see this guy who did it. So, oh, Jesus. That's how his popularity boomed at the end when they gathered to see him ride into the uh, Jerusalem. Why ha We haven't read about Lazarus, though. Uh, he, I, don't, uh, I don't think the account covers it. You get it that, happened. Don, and maybe other places. Oh, what the heck? Read all the Gospels. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's big time because the John's account says that the Jews tried to kill Lazarus, too. Because he was evidence of his power. Wow. They kill him and they sought to kill. And it's believed that Matthew and them don't speak too much of Lazarus to protect him because he was still alive when they wrote, versus John could write about it because he probably had died by then and his life wasn't in danger. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, why would he do? Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king is, yeah. I mean, that's the Bible commentaries description of this section. And it's like, when did that happen? When did he turn to this like king? When it's did kind of an that? afterthought narrative that's being added there? He didn't ride in as the, as the accepted king of the Jews. He rode in as an accepted king to some that were at the roadside, but not all. And those some um, just, do you have any idea of like percentages? <laughs> Is it like a mm -hmm. lot of people? It's small. Yeah. small. And the irony of that is that he rides in on that donkey and they're throwing stuff and they're worshiping or calling him out because they heard of the miracle of Lazarus. When he's taken by the Rome, Romans and tried, they all abandon him. They consider him a failure. Another another Messiah guy who's going to die. Big deal. Were there some before that tried this, I assume? I'm sure there have been many people who had pretended to be Christ. Mm -hmm. Would be later after he ascends, because he'll warn his apostles. Don't believe those who come and say they're me. Yeah. Okay. Um. Gets to Jerusalem, goes to the temple, drives out the merchants. Second time. Second time? That twice. Oh. That's the second time he's done it, yeah. Did we talk about this already? No, because it's not, all the accounts are different. Okay, calls them den of robbers. Um, the priests and teachers were indignant when he started to heal children and praised him. And they praised him saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Um, and they said, do you hear what they're saying? Yeah. The what? leaders, the Jewish leaders, yeah. they're standing there with each other and they're saying, do you hear what's going on? Yeah. Do you hear how much power he's got? Oh, he's okay. Got just religion from our hands. Okay. Yeah. But it says, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. And Jesus like, yes. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> there's both that? accounts are there. Yeah, so they're bringing it back on him in this set setting. They're saying, do you hear what they're saying about you? And what does Jesus say? Yes. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city. So, so he, he just uses their Old Testament. Said, have you never heard that? You know, you know, he just owns them again. It's just odd. Okay. Jesus curses a fig tree. Ah! <laughs> Withers a fig tree that does. <laughs> We're going to do interpretive scripture. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It doesn't. This is really important, man. This is a important. <laughs> it comes from Bethsaida or uh, Bethany. To come back to Jerusalem, he left and he went away. Comes back, right? And he, it's the morning. 
Why did he go away, by the way? To sleep. Just he doesn't sleep in the city? No, he's not sleeping in the city. He leaves. He either went to Mary and Martha's again or because they were his friends, okay. or he went somewhere else, but he came back is the morning time and he mm -hmm. sees the fig tree from afar off. And it, it's it's its leaves look so attractive. And he gets there to get some fruit and there's nothing there. So he curses the fricker. And then the other account, and it withered quickly. Quickly <laughs> withered. Right. Yeah. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Yeah, yeah. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, what they probably were forbidden from eating were figs, probably, not apples. Okay. And when they ate the fruit that was forbidden to them, uh, they made costumes of fig leaves to hide behind. And that was the first expression of religion. I'm going to dress myself up and I'm going to hide behind leaves. Uh, to so Because God, when God came, he's like, you know, what are you wearing here? You know, what, what did you bring up here for you? I can see your nakedness and your sin. Well, they thought they could hide behind the fig leaves. So you come out to the nation of Israel that's going to be destroyed. And that fig tree represented a nation that outwardly had all the leaves and looked like it would have fruit. But when he went to get the fruit, there was nothing there. And he destroyed that fricker. And that's a picture of what he's going to do to Israel. He's going to wipe them out because they have all the pretense of being religious, fig leaves, but they have no fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we will wither that quickly if we aren't bearing fruit. Well, that's how uh, somebody using fear to get people. Yeah. <laughs> it's really specific to the house of Israel. They were God's people and they had covenants that he blessed them. And they did everything against what he said. Everything. They had come. Their Messiah had even come. And now they were going to put him to death. So he just foreshadows it and says, you don't have fruit, you Jews, you don't bring fruit worthy of repentance, you're screwed. And he, he showed that by that. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I didn't obviously. Yeah. Um, I just want to reread what he read, what he said then. Um, yeah. What he read them. Just <laughs> it's Withered tree. Good shakes. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So I would assume that's why people apply this tree analogy to ourselves. But like and, and the promise Jesus gave there to themselves that they could move a mountain with faith. So you have Bethel and you have these colleges that are saying, it says it right here. He's talking to his apostles who are going to stay behind and do miracles. Yeah. He's talking like a Jew. You can move mountains. He doesn't mean it literally. He's talking about the great things they'll do. Not us. And it's, sorry, but just to re-clarify, it's the fig tree is the is the jewish nation at that time yeah he's telling them if you have faith you can do what i just did and yeah. kind of put to death religion or all these different things and yeah. okay that makes sense that makes sense is my answer to everything but well good that's what we want <laughs> something making sense seems important well it's got it i mean we're supposed to worship him with our mind you know, if that makes sense to your mind, you know, how do you worship him? Yeah. But like faith, it does not make sense. Like some things don't make sense. Yeah. Like faith is, uh, is outside of proof, but we do have evident evidences that contribute proofs that contribute to faith. We're not in a vacuum, but it depends on how hard your heart is. If you look at a child born and develop, if you look at nature, if you look at the stars and you say, this is all biological, you have a hard heart, so you have no faith. I don't know. Okay. Um, 
authority of Jesus is questioned. So when he goes back to the temple courts that day, the next day he was teaching. They ask, what authority do you have to teach from? This is the story from the previous episode where I was like, he throws out a question <laughs> that I, this is the first time I'm seeing it. Where like, they could have said so many different things and you're told that they deliberate on what they should say. Yeah. And if they said any of those answers, he probably would have had a. He would have slaughtered singer. them with anything they said. <laughs> yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's, that's why he's called the master teacher. When you really look at what he says relative to the options and to what they what he was doing with them, he was slaughtering them left and right with what his words, because he's the word of God. Yeah. So what, what do they say? Oh, they say, you know, what gave you this authority? And he's like, let me ask you one question. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what, uh, where did John's baptism come from, heaven or human origin? And they sit back and they go. If we say it's from heaven, then why did he'll say, why don't you believe him? But if we say it's from human, then they'll fear that we didn't think John was a prophet. So they say, we don't know. And he said, yeah. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's really funny. Yeah. Kind of like, truthfully, this stuff helps me understand you more. Oh, like, really? I, yeah. Cause I think you take these same teaching strategies Oh yeah. Like naturally. And cause you see, that's how Jesus the spirit. Came. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned how he does it. So I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know it for a long time. Didn't register. And I like, didn't mm. get why you would do it that way. And mm. I still, I see now why you do it that way because Jesus did it that way. I wonder why Jesus did it that way. Sometimes like, it feels like showman me for some reason. <laughs> like it feel, do you know what I'm trying to say? I do. And, but you see, we got to remember we're humans. So humans have to eat, they have to drink. They have to, and you can't just give humans something they're not ready for. So you have to use wisdom and judgment on how much you give, when you give it and how you give it. If you care that they understand. Now, when they receive it, they're going to be angry and they get mad and they think that you're a dick or something like that. But he knew how, and I try to do the things that are going to cause them to not look at me like I'm anything, but to look inwardly and think, what the hell is that jerk saying to try to bring that forward? So when he's tough, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not out of trying to win. It's out of trying to love better. Yeah. Do you think that he is doing things to deter the attention from himself to God, to the father? I think he's trying, he's trying to keep that in order, in order, but he, at the same time, he's paradoxically trying to get them to look to him and believe on him. Yeah. And my job is to take any attention off me and put it all on him. Always to put it on him. Because when you start to put it on yourself, and that's why he gives it all to his father, because that's what was empowering him. He was still in flesh. He was still being tempted. He was still going to die. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, so there are two more parables. Parable of the two sons, parable of the tenants. Um, before that, though, the Pharisees do not... Oh, so he's saying these parables to the Pharisees who just question him on his authority okay. teach. And so I wondered if the Pharisees will see like in the parables, the Pharisees know the answer to these. It just was curious. I just wanted to say that they know the answer to them, but then they respond by like, still wanting to kill him. I don't know. Their answers were curious to me. So it's just a thing to note before I talk about the parables, but okay. So the parables of the two sons, um, first son, I think it's just, sorry. I think it's just the language that's confusing me, particularly with the Pharisees answers to the parables. So yeah. the parable of the two sons, the first son says he won't do work and this, and then he does. The second son says he will do work and then he doesn't. And Jesus says, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first is what the Pharisees said. 
And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So I guess I'm just wondering like, which I don't understand if the Pharisees were correct in saying the first or what Jesus is actually is saying here. I just didn't get it. I think what he's saying is there's one type of son who will give you lip service. Yeah, yeah. dad, go, I'll go. And there's another type of son who has an attitude of no, but they go and do it. Well, Comparing the Pharisees to the one son and the whores and the tax collectors to the other. Right. He's the ones who says we do it with our mouth. We, we worship God, but their, their lips speak it, but their hearts are far from him. But we have the, the, the whores and the prostitutes and all that, same thing. And they might not say, oh, uh, speak all the religion, but they go and do the Father's will, which is to believe. Mm -hmm. And so says, he's making a comparison between okay. those two sons and those two people. The, I think where I was confused is that the believing is the work. Like the belief is what is being likened to work in the parable yes right. yeah yeah do not repent and believe him okay that make i that makes sense i get that now yeah. I, it, something about the way it was worded really confused me i thought the parables or the pharisees were right somehow oh. so, okay but then it goes to the parable of the tenants this one was wild to me so the there's a landowner planted the vineyard, built all the stuff, and the tenants basically destroy anyone who comes to try to reap the harvest from that. These people that are renting the land, including the son, finally, and throw, cast him out and don't allow him in the vineyard. C clearly a type for Christ. Um, and the Pharisees, again, they Jesus asked, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And the Pharisees say, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in his eyes and continues. Do you want, should I keep reading? No. Okay. Content, but remember where you left off. Okay. So important to your understanding of the scripture relative to the times. Mm -hmm. This tells a parable, and what he's saying is God, he had a vineyard. And he said, I'm going to make this vineyard for my people, the Jews. Mm -hmm. And send it out to them so they can build it up. And I'm going to, they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to do this, right? And then I'm going to send my servant into that vineyard to collect the fruit from them. That was with the prophets of the Old Testament. And when those prophets would come to those Jewish people who were building up this kingdom that God had given them on, the, on his land, they say, we don't want to give these prophets the fruit. So they killed them. And they killed the prophets along the way. So then it, uh, Jesus says, well, at the end, after all these years of killing the prophets, the owner of the land says, I'll send my son. Him they'll receive. Right? So the son comes and they kill him. So Jesus asked those Jews, what will happen when God comes back to those people who killed the prophets and killed his son? And the Jews themselves describe what's going to happen to them in 70 A.D. Wow. Yeah. And so it's all to them. It has nothing to do with us. That's what that whole parable is about. Okay. Note too that he says, last of all, I'll send them, last of all, I'll send them my son. Does he say that? Um, therefore, I tell you the kingdom. I don't see that. Before he sends a son, what is the what does the owner of the land say? Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son. Yeah, so, and he does. And that freaking nation 
who's killed the prophets. They wanted to hide his name. They wanted to just be what they had idols and everything else. Last of all, he sends his son, John the Baptist prepares the way and they don't want him either. And so Jesus says, so what should happen to them? And those Jews say, oh, they should be destroyed. Wow. Not only do they not want him, they say, this is their heir. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. Like So we know that they were driven, like Matthew says, by envy. They knew who he was and they wanted the power. They did not want to surrender anything over to the sway. They wanted to keep what was theirs, which has been the Jews' whole thing the whole time. They have wanted to be the people in the power. And God has been like, you're supposed to invite everybody to this party. You keep wanting to hide everything. So in this time, G Jesus, the last of all comes, and that's enough. We are done with you. So forget this Israel here on go to Jerusalem and we, we all that stuff done. I did. Okay. Several things. I didn't know prophet. Sorry, this is dumb, but prophets were killed. Yeah. He all says the prophets were killed. Well, not all of them, but most of them died. And when they would go and tell the people the will of God, they would kill the prophets. Wow. As you who kill the prophets, you've killed the prophets, right? Wow. Yeah. So there's that question. What was the other one? I had no idea that this was the parable. Okay. Um, he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time, which I assume is Gentiles. Yeah, now. Gentiles. Yeah. Okay. And will bring forth the fruit that God has wanted from that vineyard. You just wouldn't just, do it. Wow. And then, so they get the answer, right? This is that question about the Pharisees. They yeah. see exactly what should happen. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' response is, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in our eyes. Yeah. He's he, not in the Old Testament. Do you not interpret that correctly, that I am the one, I am the cornerstone of this whole thing that has been sent? Do okay. you not see? Do you not understand the scripture? Wow. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. I really so let me get, Oh, it's such a beautiful teaching right there. Then yeah. bring it down to reality. What Jesus is saying to those Jews is you have refused to be to break upon the rock. You have let your traditions and your lust and your power mongering. It stops you from being broken. So listen, Jesus there and in the Old Testament, he's the rock. Okay, And what he's saying to them is, you have never fallen upon me and been broken by me. So guess what's going to happen? The rock is going to fall upon you. Grind mm. you to powder. That's what he says. And this is the way life works for all of us. We can choose to fall on the rock and let him break up our attitude and our mind and our will and our emotion, our sin, we can choose to willingly let him break us, or we can say, no way, not me. I decide. He'll be like, fine. And then the afterlife punishment described in Revelation is really the best definition of it is a stone that slowly erodes away uh, something. It's it's called a touchstone. That's Have you ever heard of fire and brimstone? Brimstone is a rock that they use to rub off metal and get rid of the rust and everything. That's the right understanding of what God does with those who are outside and don't want and, and choose to come in. That stone will grind off everything that's not him to powder. So our choice here is to choose to willingly submit and be broken on the rock and continually throw ourselves on him or wait. Right now, that was specific to the Jews, and it literally materially happened to them. I don't think it literally materially happens anymore. I think it's all spiritual, but I think the same principle exists 
He will spiritually erode you away to nothing if you refuse to let him. Or you can be broken on him and he'll heal you. Mm. That's amazing. Isn't it amazing? That's really great. He calls himself the good shepherd. And that good shepherds, they will go out. And if they have one of the sheep in the flock that continues to go astray, the good shepherds of that day and uh, uh, would break that sheep's legs. And bind them up again. Talk about being broken. Bind them back up. Put them around his neck. And then walk with the flock. So that that little sheep would learn that this is the way to walk. Because you're taking, you're taking the whole flock off the path. So a good shepherd will use pain where they fall and break to help heal us and bring us to the place he wants. Or he'll let you just not to continually refuse him. You only break your legs however many times, and then you're going to get ground to dust by the wolves of this world. It will grind you down, and you will then reach out from the dust and say, help me. That's the picture of what you're getting there. Oh, my gosh. It's there, and it is all tied into their history. That is such an insane parable. Isn't it? Yeah, it's like all the other it seemed like just like principles but this one literally tells the tale of what's it tells the process yeah and it can and that's why i say i don't have proof but why i say the scripture is spiritually interpreted now god has been reconciled to this world he doesn't want to give you cancer and aids and as punishment but he does want you to surrender your will and you can fall on him or he'll fall on you that's beautiful i like yeah. that well, their reaction was that they heard it. They knew he was talking about them and they looked for a way to arrest him. <laughs> yeah, typical. Let's get rid of the problem. That's pretty crazy. Uh -huh. Oh, we're coming up to a chapter, Delaney. We're coming up to two chapters going to rock your world. Really? I'm yeah. excited. I hope I don't ask the wrong questions. You won't. Okay, um, what's going on? Huh? Are we done or? Yeah, that's it for okay. today. Let me stop recording though. What? Stop recording though. <laughs> I'm going to stop. stop. I'm going to stop. Oh, don't stop it yet. Wait. I want to. Oh. Listen, fall upon the rock. Fall upon him because that those breaks that he allows in your body, he will heal them back right. That's what he did for me. He healed me back better. And that's what he does. And you don't want to wait until he's going to start rubbing that stuff off. That's no fun. Out of love, too. It seems like he still rubs that stuff off. <laughs> so, but it's like voluntary. It's like you're yeah. different with it. I think you, you go through the fire here or you'll go through the fire there. Yeah. And like... It's the same thing as the workers, the the labor parable, like the same amount is paid, but yeah. one, you get to like choose and you're like out in the sun and you're working and you're gaining something from the payment and the other, yeah. it's just a payment. And yeah. like, you could see that as unfair, but you can also see it in, as cool. And I don't believe in NDEs, but most of them say whatever truth is there is that everything in life had a reason. And when you die, you understand and you no longer are saying why, why, why. You get that he was working with you the whole time. I believe there's something true to that. I don't know how, but yeah. Yeah, I do too. Well, thank you. You may shut off now. <laughs> All right, adios.